Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Fluctus Channel. Taking the high ground is one of the most important military strategies. Countries with overwhelming air power already have the advantage in any war. Gunships like the AC-130 Spectre and its newer variants give the U.S. Air Force firepower that can loiter in an area for hours and engage enemy targets within minutes. Douglas's AC-47 Spooky was the first gunship used in Vietnam with side-firing 30 caliber machine guns. It was based on the DC-47, but did not fulfill all the requirements that the Air Force needed. Later versions were equipped with various weapons, like the 105mm howitzer. M61 Vulcans, GAU-12 Equalizers, and 40mm Bofors. The latest versions have GAU-23 30mm chain guns, Before the AC-130 can take off, the weapon loaders bring the munitions to the aircraft. Ammunition such as 105mm rounds must be loaded manually into racks against the craft bulkhead. Various other storage units are available to load the rest of the ammunition for the other weapons. Ammunition stowage is also done in a manner that does not unbalance the AC-130. Once all ammunition has been loaded and safely stowed, it is reported to the pilot and crew chief. Pre-flight preventative maintenance checks and services are carried out by the maintenance team assigned to the aircraft. Maintenance and repairs are performed by Special Operations Aircraft Maintenance Squadrons. Before takeoff, the crew also runs pre-flight maintenance checks and diagnostics. This is done by the flight crew and the mission crew. Strict checklists are followed to ensure the aircraft is operable before taking off. On the flight deck, the pilots go through their own checklist. This entails checking all aircraft systems, including avionics, flight controls, and navigation systems. They inspect the hydraulic and fuel systems to ensure no leaks and that fuel levels are acceptable. Communication systems are verified to ensure clear contact with the ground crew and other aircraft. Set out. IFF. Checked. Instruments. Other systems, including the electrical and oxygen systems, are verified. And then we get to the engines. The engine starter procedures are carefully followed, and final walk around checks guarantee there is no physical damage. During this process, the crew chief supports the pilots outside and inside the aircraft. From outside, he communicates with a wired headset. Battle stations are checked, and only then does the pilot request takeoff permission. Shortly after takeoff, the pilots run the post-takeoff checklist, ensuring all systems function nominally. Special mission airmen are the term used to describe the three airmen that control the weapon systems in the aircraft. 
They are also responsible for checking these weapons before flight. Part of the mission crew are two combat systems officers who command the special mission aviators as to what to engage with which weapon. These officers run their own system checks before the gunship takes off. Weapon systems aboard the AC-130 versions have changed a lot over the years. M61 Vulcan 20mm and GAU-12 equalizer Gatling guns were employed by the AC-130A Spectre, while the AC-130U was armed with the GAU-12. These fire thousands of rounds per minute. An M102 155mm howitzer is the largest caliber weapon aboard. Crew members are protected from its dangerous recoil by a yellow recoil cage. All weapons are directed using the EO fire control system for consistent accuracy. Another dominant U.S. Air Force aircraft is the B-1B Lancer Strategic Bomber. The B-1B was a redesign of the B-1 project, where the focus shifted from high-altitude supersonic to low-altitude bombing missions. First introduced in 1980, the Lancer has seen numerous upgrades. One of these was the integrated battle station installed on these aircraft in 2014. Further upgrades have followed, and these aircraft undergo regular depot level maintenance or more comprehensive first line maintenance. More comprehensive level maintenance is performed by aircraft maintenance groups in the USA and expeditionary maintenance groups for squadrons deployed abroad. When it comes to ordnance, the Lancer can carry a variety. U.S. Navy mine men and USAF maintenance specialists work together to build inert Mark 62 quick strike mines for the B-1B. Navy personnel prepare mine components ensuring that each one matches standards. USAF technicians work to integrate these components into aircraft compatible systems. They work together to assemble the mine's casing, explosive sections, and guiding package. Rigorous examinations and tests are performed to assure functionality and safety. This collaborative effort combines the Navy's mine warfare knowledge with the USAF's expertise in aircraft weapons to ensure that the mines are properly built and mission ready for deployment by the B-1B. Arming a B-1B requires a highly coordinated effort from a team of USAF munition specialists. First, they evaluate important missile components such as data plates, aneroid delay pistons, and seeker windows. 
After applying a red ring to the munition, it's ready for loading. Another specialist inspects the BRU-56 bomb rack, also known as the Common Strategic Rotary Launcher, for components such as the Ferguson cable, or 1790 cable and top caps. To properly position the missile, a jammer driver runs the MHU-83. The crew follows a checklist to align and secure the payload. Finally, they close the bomb bay doors or load the next munition. While munitions are loaded, the air crew prepares for the mission by putting on their flight suits and testing their oxygen masks. The four-person crew enters the B-1B from a hatch behind the front landing gear. An aircraft commander, pilot, offensive systems officer, and defensive systems officer take their seats and then run a system and pre-flight check. After startup, permission is obtained to taxi to the appropriate runway where the pilot lines up for final takeoff authority. Once authority is granted, he applies full power with wings swept forward and takes off. Once airborne, the B-1B climbs to the altitude and heading he has indicated. The envisioned attack profile for the B-1B was in high-low high. That means it flies at higher altitudes to a point where it changes to a low level. Attacks the target. Fires off flares to confuse infrared homing missiles and then gains altitude after leaving the target area. Lancer can, however, fly other profiles against a target with weak air defense capabilities and release its ordnance from high. Before aircraft like the B-1B are used, the MQ-9 Reaper unmanned aerial vehicle would first be considered. Also called remotely piloted aircraft, the MQ-9 is still controlled by a pilot. and supported by a sensor operator from a ground control station. These GCSs must maintain radio and satellite links with the Reapers to keep them flying and engage targets. MQ-9s have the M designation because they can be used to launch missiles or drop bombs on targets. The Reaper can carry up to 1,500 pounds on its inboard weapon stations, 750 pounds on the middle stations, and 150 pounds on its outboard stations. Combinations of up to eight Hellfire missiles, GBU-12 Paveway laser-guided bombs, and GBU-38 joint direct attack munitions can be carried to the target. When the Reaper is ready, the pilot takes over from the ground control station. For takeoff and landings, the pilot uses normal UHF radio signals. However, these are only good for line of sight. Therefore, satellite signals are used for longer missions. There is a delay of one to two seconds from when a signal is sent from the ground control station to when the Reaper executes it. This delay is caused by the altitude at which the satellites operate. 
MQ-9s provide intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, or they can provide close air support to ground units, such as special forces or isolated units. Depending on the situation, a Reaper can always be above the area of operations using a rotational system. Or a Reaper on another mission can be diverted to support a mission that has developed increased priority. Training and operating the MQ-9 is comprehensive for future pilots and sensor operators. For that reason, many simulations are flown before they ever operate a Reaper. Airmen in several disciplines, such as intelligence analysts, air traffic controllers, and maintenance specialists, contribute to the RPA mission. Because of the support these simulated missions receive, they are highly realistic and provide training to all who contribute to the training missions. In support of U.S. military service members, the U.S. Air Force has many resources to protect them. From the heavily armed AC-130 gunship to the supersonic B-1B Lancer strategic bomber and the Reaper, the U.S. Air Force can strike anywhere at any time. That's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of our new content. See you next time.